Project 2025 is something that's been pushed forward by the Heritage Foundation, which is a right-wing think tank. They're proposing going in and giving the president the power to basically bring in incredible numbers of right-wing Republican appointees. I think abolish the FBI or the, and the Department of Homeland Security, get rid of environmental protections to allow polluting industries and carbon to flourish. I mean, pretty radical stuff, which some critics see as a sort of proto-dictatorship. Welcome to the Rest of Politics Question Time with me, Alistair Campbell. And with me, Rory Stewart. Now, Rory, what do you think was the subject which produced the biggest volume of questions this week? It wasn't overwhelming, but it was definitely the subject with the most questions. Uh, Gibraltar? <laughs> no, William Rag. Oh, William Rag. He was in Parliament with me, William Rag. Let me give you a few of them. Dave Cussell, why is Willie Gate being covered up? What's hiding behind this story? Sarah C, why doesn't employment law apply in Parliament? In any other working situation, if a member of staff gave away contact details of colleagues to an unknown party, which resulted in high risk, they'd be immediately suspended, most likely sacked. Katie Parker, why are the Tories circling their wagons around William Rag? So do you want to do one of your famous explainers about Willie yeah. Gate? Yeah, yeah. So w William Rag uh, was an MP at the same time as me, still in Parliament, stepping down. Um, he very much became a, I guess, a professional backbencher. Uh, he did quite a lot, actually, about parliamentary ethics and standards in public life, which is why it's been particularly, I guess, ironic that what seems to have happened is he's he's openly gay, but he went onto a website and somehow shared something that he felt made him blackmailable, maybe an image or something. And the man who he was dealing with then demanded, as I guess the price for not revealing this stuff, that William Rag share the phone numbers of members of parliament with him. And the man who got the phone numbers then went on what we call a fishing expedition, which is that he started sending texts to members of parliament, quite cleverly disguised. You know, they would say, hi, just getting in touch. We met in the House of Commons bar. Um, and do you remember? And, you know, send me an image of yourself. So they're quite kind of flirty uh, images, trying to, I suppose, find gay MPs who might vaguely think that they'd met someone in the House of Commons bar they were flirting with a few years ago. And a couple of MPs then responded, I think, by sending um, presumably sex explicit images back. Anyway, this has obviously led to real horror in the House of Commons that William Rag decided to share the confidential phone numbers of members of parliament um, on the basis of blackmail. Yeah. So all, what the question seemed to be saying is that although they're vaguely aware of this story. It hasn't really taken off as one of those sort of big scandals. And there does seem to be a sort of pretty concerted effort to keep it low profile. And I think who knows who it was, but the two, the stuff that I've read by the journalists who were targeted by this same operation, it was two women, one called Charlie and one called Abby, who uh, tried to get these people sort of um, into the into their network and um, anyway I guess it just does show you be very 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 careful uh, about stuff that you sort of when you start getting unsolicited unsolicited stuff on whatsapp or wherever else it might be um, but it does seem that he's he's not getting the normal sort of you know British media scandal treatment yeah it's interesting I mean my friend Matthew Paris uh, who was a uh, member of parliament in the 80s and was gay, has written very movingly and powerfully about some of the problems of being a gay MP at that period when it was career destroying for people to be aware of, of what you were doing. And of course, you, you talked a little bit about, I think, was it your Secretary of State for Wales who had to resign? Um, Ron Davis, yeah. Ron Davis, because he had been, I guess, had, had lied about being with a man. Um, but I thought this was something that we were over, that you know, there are many openly gay members of parliament now that it isn't career destroying anymore. Sex scandals shouldn't be career destroying. And therefore, it's very worrying that somebody could be blackmailed in this way, because we generally assume now in government, I mean, you know, when I joined the foreign office, 
um, people were worried if you were gay that you could be blackmailed into um, revealing national secrets. But we've largely given up on that view because generally I think we think that if somebody's openly gay that they shouldn't be available to blackmail. So, so I, I, guess, I, guess, I guess it depends on what was exchanged with Charlie, Abby or whoever else was there. Let's move on to Dozy Daisy. What are the implications for Europe and the geopolitics of Russia infiltrating European politics following the Slovakian presidential result. Did you follow that at the weekend? Roy? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, we've talked a little bit about this. So Europe remains, as we go into these European elections, on a knife edge between, I guess, traditional social democratic politics, which has been fading in Europe. I'm broadly speaking, Europe has got more and more right-wing governments. But the real push now is shift further right towards right-wing populism, driven a lot by people focusing on immigration, on climate change, and taking Russia's side in Russia-Ukraine. And Slovakia was an election we were watching carefully. Over to you. Well, the general election, the parliamentary election, was won by this by this guy, Robert Fico, um, who took power for the fourth time. But the presidential election was fascinating because the guy who was, as it were, anti him and anti the sort of pro-Putin stance was well ahead in the first round uh, well into the sort of 40s, and it's one of those where you have a runoff and it's the first one to get to 50%. And what happened during the second part of the campaign when it was down to two, uh, the challenger plus this guy, Peter Pellegrini, who was the the the, the pro-Russian candidate, um, is that they managed to turn it, and this just shows you the power of campaigning and the power of lies as well, I'm afraid, because the president has no say in foreign policy, Okay. And yet they managed to turn the whole thing into an argument about who was for or against war. Not who was for or against Ukraine or Russia, but basically they projected the opponent as being for war. And lo and behold, Pellegrini has won it. And so I think it does. 53.2 to 46.73. So Ivan Korkok, who was the guy who was challenging, he's, you know, well ahead and, and loses it in the second round. And Pellegrini... I suspect would have made Vladimir Putin quite happy. That being said, Orban, who is the sort of European poster boy for this stuff, he is facing some massive protests in the, at the moment. Uh, one at the weekend that was really, really quite huge. Next question, which I think is is really, really good and really central, um, is around Trump and his vice president. So we've got a couple on this. Kenneth John Miller. Who do you believe Trump will choose as his running mate? For November's election, and if you were both presidential candidates, who would you choose as your running mate? So I, I don't know whether people have been following this closely, but predictably, Trump. Uh, there are two things we know about Trump that he really cares about. <laughs> One of them is making a massive media hoo ha, sort of celebrity hoo ha, and the other is raising money. And predictably, he's turned his vice president search into both. So his his approach to vice president is vaguely reminiscent of of your approach, Alistair, to trying to find somebody to do this podcast with you. <laughs> he's he's gone out in a series of social media events <laughs> asking his supporters who should be his running mate. Um, but unlike you, he's also linked it to a fundraising campaign. So you get rafts of emails from Trump's campaigns asking you to think about firstly, you know, who his running mate should be, what issues the running mate should focus on. And, and as you know, the um, Trump has decided, although you know a lot of the polling suggests that the big problems for Biden are around cost of living and Biden's age, Trump's focus is on electoral interference. So this claim that you know the election was stolen, um, border control and crime. That's what he really seems to be leaning into. And then he keeps asking people not just to send him money, but to tell him who on that basis should be his vice presidents. And who, who are they suggesting? Well, um, some of them are uh, obvious people who were front runners against him. So there's been a bit of talk about Marco Rubio. Mm-hmm. Um, there's been talk about Ron DeSantis, but he seems to have ruled himself out. He was the his main contender from Florida. Talk about Nikki Haley, but she also seems to have said that she wouldn't serve as his vice president. And I think that's smart because she should be in a good position to run again for the Republican leadership in four years' time and anything that touches the Trump brand is likely to be sunk. Mm. Tim Scott, um, yeah. who is an African-American senator, um, is seen as a front leader. Um, and and you can see an incredible range of, of other people coming forward. But I think one thing that we can be certain about 
is that boy, is he going to humiliate all these candidates? He's going to put them through a sort of apprentice style run. He's going to tease them, pretend they're going to get the job. Then he's going to slag them off and knock them out. And he'll create a huge media circus out of it, won't he? I mean, how did Mike Pence emerge? He, he, he just sort of emerged, didn't he? Wasn't he a bit of a surprise at the time? Yeah, well, course... the story that story there is that um, Melania had been his great backer, ah. um, but since, as we keep hearing from, um, from 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 your friend Scaramucci, that Trump and Melania actually barely speak, and uh, um, it's unlikely that she's going to have much weight this time. There's quite a lot of talk about Representative Elise Stefanik of mm-hmm. New York, who's seen as a bit of a kind of Rottweiler. Um, anyway, any yeah. any of your thoughts on this whole thing? I guess the, the the name that popped into my head would um, was 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 one of these kind of Fox News people, you know, the sort of awful Tucker Carlson or somebody like that. I mean, he won't. Let, let's just think about the psychology of Trump. Why did he like Mike Pence until he hated Mike Pence? He liked Mike Pence when Mike Pence was sort of not very visible and didn't do very much. The minute that he became visible by saying, "Do you know what? I think the American Constitution is quite important." He turned right against him. So I think you're going to have to have a very, very large ego to take this on. Uh, So that means it's quite a wide pool. You're then actually going to probably, if you've got any sense, realize that it will end in tears for you personally. So yes, you'll get to be able to say you were vice president of the United States, which is quite a big deal, but it probably will end in tears. So that narrows it down. Um, And then I think you've got to work out which of these people are either going to be motivated by a massive self-confidence that they think they'll be able to tame him, or they genuinely, genuinely, genuinely believe in the guy. Now, you and I find that impossible to believe, but a lot of people do genuinely believe in the guy. Might he, might he even go as far as, you know, something like that Marjorie Taylor Green woman, who, um, you know, because he probably would quite like the idea of putting a woman on the ticket. So I don't know. What, what do I know, Rory? Because I, I can't claim to be inside Donald Trump's head and nor do I really want to be. Well, he, he's, he's interesting, isn't he? Because he, you know, we talked a lot about polling in the last podcast and it's interesting how he very much does seem to be somebody who is making the weather rather than being uniquely guided by polls. Yeah. I mean, often his moves are quite counterintuitive and his focus is a um, bit counterintuitive. Mm. It's very interesting how Joe Biden, who I, you know, follow his social media stuff, He's putting stuff out about Roe v. Wade and abortion all the time at the moment. So the Democrats clearly think that they're onto something with with Trump's uh, various positions on on abortion. And he does seem to realize he's in a bit of trouble because he's trying to sort of he's trying to get into a different position. He's now saying it should be the responsibility of the states, not a federal matter. And that has upset both the Democrats and the the kind of, you know, the real hard right Republican people as well. Yeah, we we should do more on that. But you're absolutely right. Roe versus Wade's um, overturning by the Supreme Court and the pushback on abortion rights in the US has massively alienated and horrified a very, very large number of voters. And if Biden wins, one major reason is going to be people's anger with Trump on what he Mm -hmm. did on abortion. And this is important because Trump won the majority of the vote of white women uh, in uh, when when he got his victory in 2016, so this is a this is a really critical issue from him. And mm. he, as you say, we can expect to see him softening his position on abortion. But of course, by doing so, taking the risk of alienating a very pumped up Republican base. Mm-hmm. Mark R. With what he calls growing questions over Angela Rayner's tax affairs. Is this going to damage Labour in the general election? I don't think there are any growing questions at all. There is there is one question which was uh, part of Michael Ash a book that Michael Ashcroft published about Angela Rayner uh, to do with capital gains on on a council house that she bought. Yeah, this is this is just to explain to people in in uh, UK law, if you sell your primary residence, um, you don't pay capital gains tax, and so people are always concerned that people are going to game this and claim that something's their primary residence when it isn't if they if they they're living between two homes and she has a partner who has another house which she spent some time in and so the conservative tack line is that they think they've picked up by following her social media that she was spending more time mm. in her partner's house not her own house when she sold it and therefore she should have paid more mm. tax she's then said and I think this probably is a political mistake on her part 
that she received expert advice from lawyers saying that she'd done the right thing, but then she's refused to produce that expert advice. Um, it's, it's, yeah, guy, it's, it's, uh, it's, um, I don't know. I mean, do, do you think it's, it's getting much traction? Do you think it's doing much damage to her? Yeah, I, I think there's an awful lot of um, snobbery going on here. I think if I think of some of the scandals which the newspapers barely bother with, and yet this one, some of them, particularly the right-wing papers, are going at it hammer and tongs. And, you know, the guy I look to a lot on tax is this guy, Dan Needle, who played a big part when Nadim Zahawi was he was looking into his tax affairs. And he said, capital gains tax, complicated over the law, very hard to blame Angela Rayner if she doesn't understand. And if she, if, if she has done something wrong uh, or paying the wrong amount of tax, that's not necessarily a crime. Uh so her saying, you know, that she got the advice and so on. I just think this is something where the right wing have got so little to go on at the moment. They're just sort of like, you know, this looks like a bit of a bad one for Labour. Let's just keep banging in it. And I am suspicious of the fact that it started off in one of uh, of uh, Michael Ashcroft's um, books. And, you know, I'd love to know how much tax he's paid down the years as a non-dom. Um, question for you. Uh, from Asparagus Next Left, oh which is God. an ama amazing name, Asparagus Next Left. <laughs> Why is the Scottish hate bill law highly controversial and causing uproar when the exact same law has been happily in place in England and Wales with no complaints from anyone for the past couple of years? So this is the introduction of a hate law in Scotland, which apparently, almost as soon as it came into force, led to thousands of complaints being uh, mounted by Scots against others, accusing them of hate speech. And 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 the centre of this is J.K. Rowling, the Harry Potter author, whose um, people tried to report for tweets around the transgender issue. So uh, uh, as I'm sure almost everybody in the world knows, J.K. Rowling is um, a committed feminist who finds a lot of the transgender movement threatening to what she thinks are the interests of women and has found herself right in the centre of this controversy. And she then slightly made more of this by, I think, slightly saying, you know, send me to prison and presenting herself as a bit of a martyr. And Humza Yusuf said, you know, I disagree with these, or I, I found your tweets offensive, but I don't think you should go to prison. Anyway, any any insights into this whole hate speech stuff in Scotland? I do find the, the, the hoo-ha that it's generated quite hard to understand. I mean, essentially what they've been saying is that this sort of, particularly with... Um, online stuff that this hate hate and abusive threatening and abusive behavior has been on the up um and it focuses on age disability transgender identity and sexual orientation not women because apparently they're doing something separate about that i i i've got a lot of time for jk rowling in terms of her sort of you know her amazing status as the the creator of one of the most extraordinary literary success stories of all time but i've i've i found the way that she stirred it up um i just i just couldn't quite get the point and 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 so i i, I think that we do have a problem with um with abuse and intimidating and threatening behavior online uh and and all i see this is is an attempt to you know to, to to warn people that there are limits and i think they were fairly clear about what those limits are it's not an attack on free speech so i just think the whole thing was weaponized in a way that whether whether that could have been avoided i don't know i suspect it will settle down and i hope it does um, it, it, it's part, though, isn't it, unfortunately, of a lot of political problems that Humsa Yusuf is is facing. I mean, I was obviously, you know, liked him a lot, very sympathetic towards him when we interviewed him on leading. But he does seem to have been, uh, to put it mildly, unlucky in quite a lot of his political moments since he's taken office. And, and one might suggest uh, more than unlucky that he's getting things wrong. He's not being as skillful a politician as one would have hoped. Because he seems to be perpetually generating <laughs> okay. these issues. That's, that, Rory, that's, that's taking me right into the next question, Rory. Yep. William Stuart Lockhead, question yep. for Rory. Yep. I've noticed that your usual rational approach to issues disappears when you're talking about the union. I find that disappointing. You normally employ reasoned arguments. I'd like to hear your defence. Do you accept anything in that? Yeah, I accept something in that. I think uh, I've always noticed this in my view about uh, Scotland. I mean, because I'm a Scottish unionist and very, very proud of being Scottish and very proud of the United Kingdom, I find it rawer and more personal than any other political issue 
and I find it very difficult to be relaxed about it. Mm. Um, mm. I, 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 and, and you're absolutely right. I mean, <laughs> I'm able to detach in dealing with Labour much more easily than I can with dealing with the uh, SNP, the Scottish National Party. And, I, and 2014, I was very passionately committed to the campaign for the union, built a huge, you know, had volunteers bring 100,000 stones, the English Scottish border to get involved in that. And, and I, I, I don't know, something about nationalism really triggers me. So I think that's a good observation. Mm. I, 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 all my normal objectivity, all my normal ability to say, oh, come on, surely you can see the other side of this disappears. And I think it's where probably I come closer to understanding some of the things that you can see, I mean, it's obviously much more extreme, but with Israel Gaza, that mm. that people feeling identity so strongly that they don't find it easy to, to hear the other side. Well, I, I thought, by the way, that the interview we did with Ed Kessler on leading, um, and by the way, we had a question uh, which slightly relates to this. It said that, you know, whether we always agree, Carla, do you always agree about who to interview on leading? Is there someone one of you would like to interview? The other has said no. Um, th th this was one where I was, this was somebody you'd heard speaking and you'd met him and and so you were pushing for him and I was like, oh God, are people really going to get this guy and what have you? But I found it fascinating. The most fascinating thing relates to what you've just said when he was talking about the difference between dialogue and conversation and that dialogue is when you put yourself in the other person's shoes. So if I ask you to put yourself in the shoes of somebody who does believe in Scottish independence, can you do that? Can you see their point of view? I find it very difficult. I mean, I can do it as a um, as a kind of a debating trick. You know, I can I can try to trot out their arguments, but it's a bit but like when I was them. well, it was a bit like when I was asking Angela Rayner to tell me what she thought um, a Tory like me thought, <laughs> and she she made a stab at it, but yeah. it was pretty unconvincing because she's so she doesn't believe it basically out of sympathy with Tories, and so yeah, I can I guess I can try to produce an account of it, but. No, I, 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 um, God, it's difficult. And you're not quite like me on this. I mean, I guess you're, you are more on the unionist side than against, but you probably felt more passionate about the Brexit referendum than you did about the Scottish referendum. Yeah. And I think the Brexit referendum sort of, un, it shook up my moorings in relation to independence for a while, I'd say. I actually thought, God, if you imagine if Scotland could get out of the UK and get into Europe again, that would be pretty cool. But I think that's a very good question. So that's a very good example there, Mr. William Stuart Lockhead, of you asking a question that I suspect you thought Rory would push back on, but actually he's accepted the premise of your of your question. Catherine Glover, between you, you must have visited quite a few British embassies. Which is your favourite and why? I've been to dozens of embassies and my favourite embassy by a mile, just because it's such a beautiful building. Uh, with an incredible garden is Paris. Yeah, it's it's we're so lucky there, aren't we? I mean, so the British Embassy in Paris um, is this wonderful kind of um, small palatial mansion, uh, very very near the President's House, um, with incredible history in it, um, and you know, going all the way back to the Duke of Wellington and and Napoleon's mistress and all this kind of stuff. Beautiful staircase. Circus. Um, the British Embassy is a very mixed bag, though. I mean, mm. if you go to Qatar, it's a kind of small little box. Um, mm. In Indonesia, uh, we got rid of one big residence, built another while I was the diplomat there, and then got rid of that again. Um, so there's always a war going on in the Foreign Office. And one of the things they keep doing, which is very unfortunate, is that they will sell these things. So they sold one in Bangkok for, I think, nearly 100 million because a lot of them are on prime real estate. Yeah, yeah. And then they blow the money. They don't use it as capital investment in the foreign office estate. What they do is they blow it on the current account. So they're essentially endlessly selling off the family silver. So the pattern over the last 50 years is that our embassies worldwide are increasingly getting sold off. The accommodation for diplomats uh, is getting worse and worse. You know, Over the last 30 years, I mean, uh, housing is getting worse and worse. And this is a problem because... British diplomats are civil servants, um, and they're not on great salaries. And one of the great um, perks of the job that used to encourage very interesting, talented people to take those salaries is that they could live in these beautiful buildings and 
have an amazing life when they were. They, they still get a pretty healthy allowances for the private school education, don't they? No, well, that's that's been that that's gone? been hack, hacked to pieces too. Yeah, okay. because now they've got now they can only get it if they're abroad for a very significant amount of time, right. and otherwise it gets removed from them. So, mm. uh, sympathy for diplomats is pretty limited because the Daily Mail can always generate a headline attacking champagne swilling diplomats. Um, but if we care about getting really good people into the foreign office, um, I think it's unfortunate that we're taking away a lot of the, the compensations, the job. Mm, mm. The, um, we should maybe put in the newsletter on that. Tom Fletcher, um, former diplomat, worked for us, worked for David Cameron, ambassador in Beirut. Um, he wrote a very thoughtful piece in the FT yesterday about the need to um, essentially modernise diplomacy to get uh, new and interesting people into it. So I think we're all on the same page. Washington's very nice as well. And also um, there are some pretty grotty embassies around the world but it's nice it, it is nice when you're working for the government if you are zipping around the world that you get into somewhere where it does kind of feel quite british and they do even in some of the ones you've been in some of those parts of the world where i suspect you do at least feel a little bit more british when you get there well i think the, the and the justification for them is that these places are designed to put britain on the map they're designed to be places that locals want to visit want to see and so the Paris Embassy has been amazing at being a place that the French president wants to go to, that um, leading French cultural figures want to visit. Um, and if you start giving up on all those buildings, then people have much less of an incentive to to turn up and see the British ambassadors and British ministers. So yeah. I, I, yeah, I'd want to keep. Um, here's a question which maybe we could do more on with more time. But NDS, what's going on with Project 2025 and the Republican mm. Party? Project 2025 is something that's been pushed forward by the Heritage Foundation, which is a right-wing think tank uh, in the US, which is proposing very, very radical changes against uh, what they call the deep state. So this is words that Liz Truss used a bit in Britain. But basically their idea is that um, the federal government is stacked against uh, the type of right-wing Republicans that they want to dominate. So they're proposing going in and giving the president the power to basically bring in incredible numbers of right-wing Republican appointees and I think abolish the FBI or the, and the Department of Homeland Security, get rid of environmental protections to allow polluting industries and carbon to flourish. I mean, pretty radical stuff, which some critics see as a sort of proto-dictatorship. Yeah, and I, I saw um, an interview recently with one of the people who's, who's behind this. He was coming out with some really, really weird stuff about, I think it was to do with surrogacy, uh, children through surrogacy. It was really kind of weird off-the-wall stuff. This is, and of course, they, 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 they call themselves a, a, a broad coalition of conservative organisations. It's sort of, if you imagine kind of 55 Tufton Street, but, you know, even larger, um, they they associate themselves with having sort of you know been part of the very influential with Ronald Reagan. Uh, you know I don't know if 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 you read Ronald Reagan's speech now. I mean, at the time he was seen as a sort of right wing devil. You read Ronald Reagan's speeches now, and compared to these guys, he's like you know he really is a moderate. So they they move. What this is about moving the dial further and further to the right. And of course, they, you know, Liz Truss in this project is something of a useful idiot. She's somebody who's a, you know, we all know she was utterly useless, but she's the former prime minister. And she can turn up at these guys events and, and literally parrot this rubbish about the deep state. Um, so yeah, you're right, we should, we should come back to this, we should maybe try and get one of the Project 25 people on the onto leading if we can find one that sort of you know isn't yeah, yeah. completely off the wall yeah yeah and no, i think that's that that would d definitely be worth doing um yeah final question from me matt Shida, um israel um it's been reported that israel is using an ai missile targeting system named the gospel in its bombardment of gaza given the excellent coverage you do on ai advances keen to hear your thoughts of it being used on the battlefield well there's a lot of different use of ai mm. in in russia ukraine and in the israel gaza conflicts um one thing that's been reported is the use for lavender system, which is the use of AI to identify Hamas militants and claims by Israeli intelligence that increasingly humans are just rubber stamping selections being made by what they would call clean clinical objective 
um, uh, machine learning mechanisms to identify who a target should be mm. or shouldn't be rather than, in inverted commas, an emotional soldier. And this, of course, has raised a lot of concerns. And you, you can see the UN talking about it. You can see other governments talking about it. But this will become more and more important because AI is not just a story around productivity and business. AI is going to be more and more central to the development of weapon systems. Yeah. No, you're absolutely right. In both of these conflicts, and doubtless others, AI is already um, a major part of what's happening on the battlefield. My last question, Richard Booker. Very excited that my wife and I are going to PMQs and a tour of Parliament in May after having met our well-known local MP on the doorstep, and he offered. How did you feel on your first time in the Palace of Westminster? And is there anything quirky we should look out for? I love the central lobby. I think the central lobby has got an amazing feel to it. Partly you stand there and you see these... The, 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 is it that you've got the sort of four parts of the United Kingdom represented on the on the ceiling? Just I think just sitting on one of those big, comfortable leather green leather sofas, just sit there for a while and watch the world go by, and you'll be amazed at who and what you see. Yeah, I love it, and I think the details, the architecture. Look at the doors, the brass moulding on the door handles, the glass, and obviously think about people like Churchill and Gladstone sitting in the in the same chamber yeah and if you get into the central lobby and you see the statue of churchill you can see that one of his shoes is is the 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 guilt has worn out because i think i don't know if you ever did rory but don't tory mps always touch that shoe as they go in touch the shoe yeah. yeah yeah well thank you alistair see you soon see you soon bye-bye